<clears throat> Welcome everybody to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Course Pro. We are on our fifth session and we are the winter spring 2023 class. I'll just ask everybody to mute themselves as we go through this and then if um, I need further information from somebody we can unmute. A um, few things to talk about. <clears throat> We're coming up to the break. So the break will happen from this Friday to the following Monday. Um, it's a great time to get ahead uh, or it's a great time to catch up. So I would recommend continuing to work and continuing to, to submit if you're ready to submit. Um, I won't be marking until I get back from break, but um, having a few assignments in the queue will definitely make your future selves happy. Once we get to some of the design assignments, so the plant design assignment, zone one, and final design assignment, they take a lot of work. If you're new to design, it's the first time you've ever looked at plants or conversations or things of that nature, it takes a lot of effort. So I would highly recommend working ahead. Um, we also have the soil assignment coming up, which can take extra work in terms of taking your soil samples and et cetera. You're in a place that is still experiencing winter and the ground is frozen and you can't do this. Basically, my recommendation is to find soil by hook or by crook. So if you have to dig some up and keep it inside and let it um, defrost so you can do some of the ribbon test feel or the shape dart test, that's ideal. Um, if not, you can take soil from potted plants with the understanding that it's going to be very different from soil that has parent material. Basically, potting soil has a huge amount of organic matter in it, and sometimes you don't even get on the spectrum because it has so much organic matter. That said, what you would do is you would take that material, you would say, these are the places that I would be looking to uh, make my assessment on my site, and you'd basically supplant that, that potted soil for that area. Um, and you would make recommendations based upon that conversation. So <clears throat> that would be the way to go about doing it. But that can take a bit of time as well. So I would recommend working ahead. Um, the other thing that was recently brought to my attention, which I didn't know happened, um, was that the Natural Capital Plant Database had up until a couple of months ago given free access to that plant database to Oregon State um, which had been a wonderful asset and that is no longer available. So you will see in the template that that has been scrubbed in terms of the access. And if you do have the access details, they won't work for you anymore. So unfortunately it was one of those things that um, they decided to rescind, which is understandable. Everyone gets to choose their own adventure. Uh, that means if you do wanna access the natural capital plant database, you still can for free, research a plant, you just can't research plant associations or make a search of multiple plants, which can sometimes be the reason you use that. I think for 25 bucks a year, uh, which I still pay for as well, I think it's well worth it. Um, it makes life really easy. There's a whole list of, actually I should bring them up just so folks can see the new list. Um, there's a whole list of different plant databases and things of that nature that you can work with. I'll just ask everyone to meet themselves. Um, so I'm just going to slide on down to plant the first one. There we go. And I'll share my screen. So you'll see on slide 110 of the template, there's a whole list of different um, databases. It doesn't look like they have um, uh, uh, hyperlinks, but they do. So if you click on them, there's a hyperlink on each one. Hold on, somebody is unmuted, unmuted. I'm just going to mute them. Thank you. Um, so you can go through them there. Um, my go-to is the Natural Capital Plant Database. Plants for Future is great, and they're getting better. They've got a better search. Um, the USDA Plants Database was a new one for me from Mark Krawcheck. I just finished hosting a course through Regenerative Living on Copper Forestry with him, which will be available as a self-paced course in about a month. But um, that's really amazing, as is the fire effects information service, because it's basically the effects of, well, basically plants that work with fire ecology. Uh, the rest of these are all good lists. Um, and then if you do decide to use the natural, plant, natural capital plant database, there's two tutorials here. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, right. So if you're behind, a couple of things to think about. Um, 
you don't have to get their certificate. This is always a big surprise to people because it's North America and we take courses to get certificates. So why wouldn't we ever get a certificate? Because no one in my, I think I'm at 14 years, I might be close to 15 years of permaculture has ever asked for my diploma, my certificate, not one person. So it doesn't matter, not really. Um, for the majority of those of us that are interested in this type of work, we, we get information where we can and all the rest of it. I think for most people, getting a certificate means something because of the way we were raised and getting it from a university means even more. But that being said, if you're behind and you don't think you're gonna you're going to complete on time, and remember, and this is important to note, I'll actually just bring this up. All assignments are due on the final due date. This includes resubmissions. So there is no extension on that final due date. And I'm just going to go to our April 24th. So everything is due on April 24th. There is no extension. This is really important to know because of the way we turn over, because the, we have a brand new course, like I have a brand new course of students starting up the week after the break, there is no extension. So everything has to be in on April 24th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So you could work to have everything in. Um, as much as it seems like a heroic moment, don't be the person that puts in eight assignments the day before. Uh, I tend to mark on the weekends before the final due dates for the course I'm working on. And there was a gentleman who put in eight assignments on Sunday. As per what I've said before, if you put in assignments very late, you may not get as much feedback. You, you'll likely not get video feedback. You'll just get a couple of points from me. So it's not the way to go. And then the last option is for a small fee, um, you can re-enroll. So you can re-enroll into the next session. Now, what I would recommend <clears throat> is if you're feeling behind already, just work at the course at your own pace. So get the assignments in as you can, even if you're only at assignment two, you know, or, or lesson two, get lesson two in, then week three, then week four. Maybe you get to week six or week seven. And if you do have to re-enroll, you just are that much further along. If you're in a place where for personal reasons or professional reasons or whatever, you're just behind and you know you're not going to be able to do it, then maybe yeah, reach out to Dow, re-enroll, figure that out and get that off your plate. Um, this is something I have to remind a lot of people of. This is not a make or break course. This won't make you or break you. And if you're dealing with something personal, if you have a major illness, if something that's going on in your family, don't make this the thing that breaks uh, the camel's back. It's not worth it. Um, the two or the three things I wanted to make note of, specifically the two, is that uh, Rainwater Harvesting with Gord Baird is going to be running from April 20th to June 8th. This is the rainwater harvesting course I wish I had 10 years ago. Gord was an amazing rainwater harvester when I met him 10 years ago, and he is exceptional now. He is a, uh, a water commissioner for his local water board. He is an international rainwater harvester, as well as filtration, uh, uh, filtration expert. He's worked at small scale, institutional scale, community scale. Um, he will be going through all of these different processes. He will be giving the opportunity for students to be able to do their own design and to be able to, to get be given feedback by the end of the course from him, very similar to what I do with you, except it'll be a one-time feedback process, but you can ask questions throughout. And basically he will disseminate his close to 20 years of rainwater harvesting experience to you. There are people who have written books about rainwater harvesting that do not have the experience and the uh, projects in the ground that Gord does. And so I, I say this with full, enthusiasm that Gord is the person that I like to be, I would have wanted to be up taught by. And he is hard to pin down. So this course has been a year and a half to two years in the making because he's so busy. Basically, he is booked anywhere from six to eight months in advance because people know he is the guy to get for rainwater harvesting, for gray water, for composting toilets, for full system integration. If you want to learn more about Gord, uh, go to eco-sense.ca. Um, Gord and his partner, Anne, have created an incredible site. It was the first uh, two-story cob load-bearing building that was rated for seismic in North America, if not the world. Um, they grow anywhere between 80 to 90% of their own food, and they push that usually to 95 to 99%. 
um, they are uh, quintessential. And hopefully in the coming years, I will get them to do a homesteading course or just the beyond what you think you could do course. They also run a nursery. The second course that I highly recommend for anybody who is going into a design that has a lot of plant material is learning how to propagate. Um, a course like this has not existed since I began my work, uh, mostly because most people wanted to do it live and most people who work with plants don't want to be in front of a computer. Full stop. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I do this because I think it's useful and I can, you know, I can have a little bit of uh, detrimental sitting in my life. But getting people who are interested in propagation to actually do an online propagation course was not possible until COVID. Um, Peter started Tree Eater Nursery uh, close to 15 years ago, and then uh, 10 years ago decided he couldn't find the plants he was looking for, so he learned how to propagate. So this is a temperate course. If you're looking for tropical plants, this is not the course to take. This is for temperate. Um, Peter has already been sending me his information and his videos and his calendars you know he's gone into the point of showing you what to do and when to do it throughout the season so highly recommend if you're interested in propagation even starting to learn the basics peter's course will be amazing now the way these courses work the way i run these is if you're on the pre-launch form then you will have access to the pre-launch price which for both these courses is 199 which is 150 dollars off the 349 regular price and you will have access for roughly eight days starting for rainwater harvesting with Gord Barrett on March 20th and for propagating woody edibles on April 1st. So if you're on the list, you get access. If you're not on the list, you don't get on, don't get access. Finally, Gord has been willing to entertain the idea of doing a gray water design course, which I cannot recommend enough to learning how to do. Uh, gray water is very important to understand. And we're going to actually talk about it during this session. I've installed a couple of gray water systems and, um, there's a number of little tidbits. You can absolutely buy uh, Art Ludwig's book, Creating a Gray Water Oasis, and get by. But if you're one of those people that likes to have somebody actually teach you and have Q&A, that's why Regenerative Living uh, was begun, because I wanted to have that opportunity. So with that, let's jump into some questions. Now, Colin, I know you're here, and I did ask you to link your assignment. So if you can do that as I start to read off your questions, that'd be really useful. Okay, so sure. Paul... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to get uh, internet access to my computer, but I'm going to try and send that now. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, so Colin's first question is about water retention. Is the name of the game here in dry, hot Buran? With less than 70 mil of rain annually in salinated groundwater, we rely on pump semi-salty well water and municipal water. The site is very flat with a slight one meter drop over 80 meters that allows our flooded ditch irrigation channels to work that are roughly 0.4 meters of width, 0.3 meters of depth, and 200 meters of channel. We're looking for ways to both reduce evaporation in the irrigation channels and to capture rainwater in our dry, compacted, sandy soils. We're considering a few options and would love your thoughts. Dig compost ditches that we bury and forget about. On the side of the center on the ch uh, irrigation channel in intervals allowing excess water to sink in and create a resource hub for irrigation or for vegetation. Terraform the more open areas of the property with long wavy boomerang swales that have just enough drop of water to aggregate and pool for gardens centered between date palms. Reducing evaporation. Is it possible worth it for such a small slope little rainfall? Switch to drip irrigation. It seems like we would lose a lot of flexibility with this option. Sunken gardens that are also wicking beds. Dig a hole, fill with rocks, cover with sheet. Fill with compostable material, logs, compost soil, and plants. Always think about canopy mid-tier and ground cover succession to reduce ground temps and, and capture moisture. We're considering a fish pond and frog bog as a water storage mechanism, the most shaded area of the farm, also for mosquito management. The kids that visit the site for field trips and camps would love it. Thoughts on this in a very hot, dry climate. Inverted herb spiral garden that is dug down. Okay, so this is a great question. and I've worked in some dry, not as dry as you have here. Um, I'll, I'll refer to the Albida project created by Neil Spackman, who I'm in talks with to create a course within the next couple of years about lessons learned and conversations there. The Albida project is in Saudi Arabia, and they get between two and three inches of rain every five years, and it comes sporadically. Very hot, dry, very sandy, dusty, very rough. Generally, their way of approaching it was to take a water budget and basically say that they would create earthworks that would sink that water into the ground and that that would 
they would pump out water that they only captured. So they never took water out of the aquifer. Now, years later, and I highly recommend taking a look at the videos on YouTube, uh, Neil did a recent one that showed the difference and the grass plains and all the rest of it that we created. That has proven the model to the point to where the Saudis are putting somewhere in the order of five to $600 million into regreeding portions of the entire coastal area of Saudi Arabia and has led Neil to create uh, Regenerative Resources, which is a company that works specifically on coastal areas, mangroves, to create integrated vertically and horizontal uh, projects that produce income um, accommodations, potentially to produce cities, and then produce product. It's a very incredible project. So when we talk about water retention in arid climates, uh, water retention is the name of the game. Now, there's a couple of things to think about here. Conservation will always be for a return on energy investment more valuable than creating anything else. So however it is you can do that, uh, usually when we're talking about water for vegetation, um, we're talking about mulch. So if there's any way to increase mulch within or around any vegetative plantings, uh, do so. Uh, in Kenya, it was difficult to do because mulch equaled habitat for snakes and snakes were poisonous. And so we had to become pretty creative by having working animals that could go after the snakes and at the same time increase the mulch in and around the area. Because you already have flooded irrigation channels, um, first question is, are those flooded irrigation channels, do they have shade cloth over them or are they open to the air, Paul? They're open to, to the air right now. Okay, so first things first is I would be putting shade cloth. I'd be basically creating hoop houses over all of the irrigation canals um, and then putting on shade cloth immediately. That means okay. that as you're moving water through them, you're not going to have the evaporation as if it was open. You may in time want to do that vegetatively, but of course, vegetative is going to take water. And at this point, we want to conserve whatever we have. Um, second is, and you get into this further down, but I'm going to move it up is sunken gardens in dry areas that don't get a lot of vegetation uh, increases moisture retention by a factor of two. So if you can sink that garden down and if you can work in, um, now it's not necessarily a wicking bed because usually wicking beds, you're putting water underneath into a reservoir and then it's soaking up. I think as soon as you're dropping down, I don't know if the effort, the materials and the process and all the rest of it to create a wicking bed is actually gonna pay off. So what I would do is I would probably do something like a huga culture that's sunken. So that way the top of the plants are, you know, six to eight inches below grade. And then you have the ability to flood that area with, um, with your channels. And generally I would do that with, you know, this idea of compost ditches, because the great thing about huga culture, and huga culture, again, for anybody who's new to the word, H-U-G-E-L-K-U-L-T-U-R, huga culture, um, was popularized, not created, but popularized by Sepp Holzer, S-E-P-P-H-O-L-Z-E-R, Holzer, over in Austria at uh, the Holzerhof, which was his farm that was given to him by his father. And then he created, or uh, the Kermaterhof, and then he recreated a farm called the Holzerhof. And basically, Hugen cultures are digging deep trenches, so sometimes a meter, uh, sometimes a meter and a half for sap, um, uh, by a meter wide, lining them with decomposing logs. And this is important. You want to work with logs that are already semi-decomposing. You can use fresh logs, but generally all logs have some level of, of fungicide within their, um, their, their wood. And so you usually want at least a month between the cut and the application. And then you put in things like... Um, uh, manures, or you put in things like compost scraps, or you put in things like uh, vermicomposting if you're if you're doing it, and then you pile soil on top. And usually it's above grade. So um, the huga cultures I built with up, excuse me, were like a meter to two meters tall. They were as tall as a person. Um, and for him, they had a microclimate factor because of the way they were shaped. They had uh, different depths. So usually you would do like. Um, root crops in the middle, you would do climbers on top, you would do um, pumpkins and, and curcubids at the bottom. Um, they would decompose in situ, so you would create more um, 
soil over the length of the decomposition of the hookah culture. And it would create a little bit of heat, not much, but a bit because it's decomposing in a little bit of heat. And so basically it would be water holding capacity. And for what Sepp would do is he would, he would continually put potatoes in and parsnip and things like that. Basically at year five, he would send in the pigs and they would completely destroy the hookah cultures. And then he would rake it out and he would use it as topsoil. For him, it was a soil building uh, mechanism. It was a way to build soil. And this is what people don't understand because they get um, individuals who are super gung ho about an element in permaculture and they get excited about it and they talk about it without understanding its origin. So SEP would create these hookah cultures to create soil. Now, the great thing is, is that because you have sandy soil, the other name of the game is you wanna increase organic matter as, as much as possible because increasing organic matter, 1% on an acre increases water holding capacity by 20,000 gallons or 80,000 liters. So if we can increase organic matter on an acre by 1%, we can increase that organic matter, we can increase it by 20,000 gallons, which means that because it's a pretty flat site, that 70 mil of rain can actually seep in, soak in, and actually have some value in the area. The other thing that I want you to think about, Colin, is working with biochar. So biochar was originally discovered down the Amazon basin. It was called terra preta, as they were taking a look at these Amazon cultures that were able to have high levels of agriculture, because this is something that perplexed people for a long time. Uh, tropical soils are different than temperate soils. Tropical soils, basically, when you take a look at tropics, the nutrition, call it, is in the vegetation. And that's because it's always growing. There's always multiple tiers. There's always vines. There's always ground covers. There's always tubers. There's just so much going on that all of that nutrition gets pumped into the vegetation. So you kind of think about it like this, the soil and the, nutri the nutrition in the soil is in the vegetation. In the temperate climates, our nutrition is in the soil. In arid climates, you're basically gr groping for as much nutrition as possible. So what we want to do is we want to create as much coral reef, if you will, um, areas where microbes as well as nutrients can gling onto something within the soil. Now, organic matter takes a lot of time to develop. Biochar doesn't. So biochar is basically uh, carbon materials that are burnt at low oxygen levels. So that way, instead of completely combusting, the gas, which is usually combusting off of these materials, basically gasify. So basically, the area within this woody materials or carbon materials off gases and you so you get an incredible increase of surface area for volume something like a hundred to a thousand times and under microscope you get what's called recalcitrant carbon which means once it's been calcified it's never going to decompose any further until you get to the 100 200 500 or a thousand year mark and usually with biochar, what we do is we inoculate it. So we inoculate it with things like urine, or we inoculate it with things like aerated compost extracts and teas, or we inoculate it with things like fish emulsion. And so basically you make the biochar and uh, there's lots of great ways to do it. Some, some's a, a top lit uh, oven. Some of them are, are, are troughs or bins or pits that are at a 30 degree angle because of the way oxygen flows into them. There's lots of ways to go about it. YouTube is your friend here. Um, I am looking at developing a biochar course with a couple of exceptional um, instructors. So we'll be looking at that in the future. And then once it's finished, you grind it. You want to be wearing a respirator at this point where calcium carbon is very fine. Biochar is very fine. You, want to, you don't want it in your lungs and you want to grind it up. And then usually you're soaking it in one of these either fertilizer amendments or biology amendments. And then what you do is you're integrating it into your soil. Now, there is a bit of controversy around biochar. Uh, Vandana Shiva came out um, famously that biochar could make us abuse our soils more because it gives them more capacity and we may not take on processes that would be important having soils being able to rest from time to time. Uh, but in places like yours, where it's so sandy and you don't get as much moisture, Biochar also, because of its surface area, has the ability to hold on to an incredible amount of water because of the capillary action, the adhesion and cohesion of water. So 
Water has two micro forces that will resist gravity. One's called adhesion, which is the ability to water to cling to something else. And the other is cohesion, the ability to water to cling to itself. These together are called capillary action. And it's why if I was wearing a white shirt and spilt red wine on me, you'd have this wicking effect where you get this red stain that would move three-dimensionally. And that's what happens underground. You have a wetting pattern. <laughs> now with sandy soil, you don't have as much wicking action upwardly, which is important to understand that um, with sandy soils, you can do subsurface irrigation like wicking beds, but it, it cannot, it's sometimes not as beneficial because of the way that the water, the water wicks out. So basically I would cover my irrigation dishes if I was in your situation, I would do sunken beds, I would create huga cultures, I would add the soil back and I would add it with things like organic matter or biochar, inoculated biochar or compost if you had it. I would develop the skill or access the skill to create aerated compost extracts and teas. Extracts being the one you'd want here. Extracts are for ground, teas are for foliar application. And basically aerated compost extracts and teas are using really good compost. So if you if you don't know how to make really good compost, we could talk about that, but creating really good compost and then putting it into a mesh non-flexing bag, which means no pantyhose. We're talking about a rigid bag that is made of mesh. Um, and you put that compost in, then you put it into a, a body of water that you know is clean, but is not sterile. This means we don't want any uh, chloramated water. We don't even want chlorine in our water. And if we are using chlorine water, we want that to off gas for 24 to 48 hours. And if we do have chloramated water, which is what a lot of um, cities are moving to because of the uh, transit time between the pumping station and your house and issues with piping, chloramine, uh, chloramines are harder to get out of water. Usually it takes colloidal silver or citric acid. Um, but basically you want clean water, rainwater is great. So you're putting in your compost into this non-flexible bag, and then you are pumping air through this body of water. How much air? Well, you want the water to look like it is a rolling boil. That's really important to hear what I said. A rolling boil, but there's no heat involved. So basically it's pumping air through a small pump. I use what's called an Eco Plus 5 pump for a 45 gallon um, barrel. If I was moving to an IBC tote, which is a thousand liters, I would move up to the Eco Plus 7. And then basically for an extract, all you're doing is extracting all of those microbes out of the out of the compost into the water. And then you have this water that you can then apply. So this is a way to take microbes that are in compost that if you did tilt in, tilting again being moving uh, material into the soil, just the first two or um, uh, single inch, so three to six centimeters. You don't want to dig it in. You don't want to upset all the soil and upset all that mycorrhizal activity or bacterial activity. And then what you're doing with this now as a solution, instead of the compost that you would tilt in as a solution, you're then taking a backpack sprayer or even I've, I've done sort of the, the holy blessing. I've taken a couple of um, uh, branches, switches of, of deciduous trees, dipped it into my compost tea and, and basically blessed the beds and blessed everything to help uh, distribute it. Um, that then increases the amount of microorganisms. And if I was to do that in your situation and had a lot of mulch, I would pull back the mulch, I would apply the compost extract, uh, aerated compost extract, and put the mulch back. So that way it's right on the soil surface. This increases the biology, which is increases the potential to create more organic matter. Other thing I would work at is if you have kitchen scraps in enough material to make composting ditches, I would instead apply that to vermicomposting. I would compost with worms. The reason for this is if you build a vermicompost that has the ability to take off the leachate. So usually if you build it in a bin that has the ability to have a little spigot right at the bottom so that way it can take off the leachate. That compost leach, uh, com vermicomposting leachate is an incredible fertilizer for plants, not to mention the castings that come from worms and the worms themselves. So instead of putting that compost underground, that to me is we've kind of moved away from running it through livestock. And I always think 
if I've got a resource, can I run it through livestock once or twice to give me manure or give me uh, materials from those animals, be they their intrinsic characteristics of how they eat or how they guard or <coughs> if they take care of pests. Um, and then of course there's uh, there's there's meat, there's milk, there's feathers, there's bones, there's all of these other materials. Um, and worms are probably one of the easiest, most accessible livestock to get into um, on small scale or even beginning. So I would want to see those those uh, those that those kitchen scraps go through those worms, and then those worms can be brought back into the area. The problem with long, wavy boomerang swales. Um, is I just don't know if you're going to get enough uh, saturation to make the swales worth your while. Um, I think if you if you move to that uh, at 70 mil, I just don't know if you're going to get what you need. You might, and you may want to do one or two experiments and make sure you have moisture meters and things of that nature, but I just don't think that that's the case. Now, if you switch to drip irrigation, it sounds like you already have an, an area of retention and you're using that to flood downwardly. Um, if you move to drip, you would have to move to some sort of pumping technology. You would use less water, probably by two or three X, I would imagine. But then you would have the cost of the pipes. You would have to be conscientious about filtrating the water because drip irrigation can get clogged very easily. But the nice thing about drip in arid environments is that if you're above the soil, but below the, the mulch, all that water goes directly to the plants. And because I worked on the west coast of Canada, where we get three to four months of drought a year, um, that can be a really important thing to do. The other thing that you may want to do is uh, around your, your plants, you may want to put a rock or two. And these are large scale rocks. The reason for this is that um, usually in arid environments, you get condensate in the mornings. And this can be a great way to harvest water outside of the uh, outside of the precipital events. You can actually harvest it from condensate. Um, so I might experiment with that, especially for heat loving crops. So your solaceae, your eggplants, your tomatoes, um, new trees. It's great to put a bunch of rocks as rock mulch. And so basically they condense water and they bring it down to the trees. That can be really useful as well. You already talked about canopy mid-tier and ground succession. I think that's a great idea. Um, I did this in Cuba where we did a lot of Moringa oleifera plantings where we would put the Moringa up. We would allow it grow to grow over the summer. It would create a shade environment for everything beneath. And then we would cut down during the winter to give, um, uh, to give access and then we would harvest the leaves. So I think as much as you can do that and stack, of course, with 70 mil of, of rain, that's going to be a very slow process, but Moringa is great for that. It likes growing in dry environments. Um, the inverted herb spiral is a great one. Uh, Sep would call this a creta uh, garden, where you it's basically like a dry pond and it has steps. And you will find that as you move down, you have some microclimates there. And you may want to do that with the idea of the fish pond or the frog bog, where you drop down a few levels, you have some planting regions, and then you have a bottom area that you either intentionally try to line with materials that you have. Um, and then at that point, you do have some of that mosquito control. You do have a reservoir of extra water and things of that nature. Um, so that's what I would do in your situation. I would I would go from the top to the bottom. Make, make Keep in mind that you're, you're creating a water prism uh, on your site. You don't want to drop a water to ever leave the site or evaporate the site. Either percolate down and never interact with uh, uh, plant roots, uh, or evaporate off. So basically, shade structures, sunken gardens, increasing the organic matter, using biochar, inoculated biochar, using aerated compost extracts and teas, making sure you have multiple tiers, using a lot of mulch, weighing and probably doing a bit more due diligence about the, uh, the drip irrigation. Um, generally, in arid environments like yours, I would move towards drip, only because it will help trees to establish and it'll create that flywheel that'll keep going over time. Once you get that um, baseline um, mainframe design done with your plants, uh, then it'll have a little bit easier time to start the next and the next and the next. And so I would I would explore, you know, costs, um, availability, 
installations, you know, just price it out as we do. Um, a lot of people think that uh, permaculture is exciting and then you get down to pricing out things and it's just like any other job. You just have to price things out and understand where they're coming from. So that's what I would do. Colin, do you have any uh, follow-up questions to that or conversation? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'll definitely be rewatching and taking studious notes. Um, so one question on the Google culture specifically. So we, we actually ended up digging some of the compost pits in the irrigation ditches. They seem to be working well. We have some compost in there. We have existing compost. We've been doing the Ingram method. We actually just built a chicken coop today. So we're going to be doing chicken composting as well um, and exploring with that. And we also have somebody very knowledgeable um, who's working with some of the extracts and teas. So I'll talk with them about where we wanted to start doing that on site. Perfect. The biochar too. I've heard of that, but that, that excited for that. But we built, dug a really deep, deep hole, but maybe 0.8 meters. And then half of it we used as a, just a giant compost pit. And the other half, we were going to do something like a, a wicking bed where we throw some rocks at the bottom, not too, um, and just let it from the, the flood irrigation drip down and then have like a reservoir under water. With the wicking, it makes sense it wouldn't flow up. Um, so maybe we instead turn that into a hugel culture, like you said. Um, but what is that an inverted hugel culture where it goes down like from, yeah. from the side? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll draw it out. And the one thing I wanted to say there is um, you're not composting in a pit. And this is important to understand. Compost requires a huge amount of oxygen exchange. The microorganisms in compost need to respire. So they need to, to bring in oxygen. They need to give off CO2. And so um, like I, I'm living in a place, I'm, I'm, my family and I are taking a year in, in Ecuador. And um, I was, I, I just landed. I hadn't made my compost bins yet. And um, the house had a, uh, inherited a gardener. And so the gardener was here and they dug a big pit and they're like, great, throw all your kitchen scraps in there. And I'm like, that's great. That's a place to put it. And if you leave it there for a couple of years, it can be a place to plant a tree. This is a way to actually uh, you know, take a three or four year detour to get a tree. But in terms of composting, you're not going to get the air exchange necessary to compost. It's a, it's a refuse hole for sure. And it will decompose somewhat. But really when we're talking about compost, when we're talking about broken down material into its component, small scale carbon bits. And the reason why I'm so hesitant to say anything about those H words, humus and humic acid, is that there is a big uproar right now in the soil community that humic acid doesn't exist and thus humus doesn't exist. It's actually a number of different subforms of a small scale carbon that we have yet to identify. And some people are holding on to it, some people aren't. But anyways, having aeration within your compost is so exceptionally important. And so I don't want you to lose that because what will happen is you may find that things will go anaerobic. And anaerobics, if you do produce vinegars, if you do produce alcohols, which is what happens when you go anaerobic, um, those are biocides. Those, uh, uh, they kill life, they kill microorganisms. So you can be working at cross purposes if you do it that way. So food for thought, we can talk about that a little bit more, but um, so let's draw out what this would look like. So I did this in Cuba when I was there. We did sunken hoogles because it was so hot. So we've got our ground area here and I'll use orange to showcase that we're digging. So normally in a hoover culture, we would dig down in like, you know, one meter, by like one meter. And the, the last hookah cultures I, I dug were a meter and a half by a meter and a half and they were fed off of my shop. Um, and it won't be today because we're already at 1240 and we're through the first question. So uh, for everybody else, we're going, we're going late today. Um, and then here, what I would do, uh, what we did in, in Cuba is we dug this, we put, we put our, our wood here and we mound it up like so. And you have to think that a hugo culture will lose in usually the first two years, it'll lose up to 40% of its height. So whatever you want the working height to be, just consider if you if you have a, uh, let, let, let's make this easier for math. Let's say two meter. And let's say you fill up a meter. You're going to be at 0.6. And that's going to be a meter point four to reach in and work these beds. So, you know, you're going to have to do the math to go, well, I don't want to reach in super deep. So like six, eight inches is a nice 
working depth. And so you may, depending on how deep it is, you understand how I can't give you the dimensions because of the depths and, and the reduction, but you can do the math on this. If you want it to reduce to six to eight inches, if you want it to reduce to like, um, you know, 15 to 20 centimeters, then you're going to have to maybe even go up to the top and then have it sink down over time. Um, but you can do it this way. The other way to do this is if you have big trenches, you can actually do kind of hygge cultures inside them. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for your situation, just because if you do get a major event as we are internationally, right, we're getting cloud bursts all over now. We're getting, I don't know if anybody's watching Freddie, the longest running tropical storm that's going from like Madagascar back to Tanzania, back to the ocean. It's dropping like years worth of rain. It's, it's killed 21 people thus far. But we need to be thinking about those things. Somebody lower down here talks about climate resiliency. Part of climate resiliency is going, huh, what we are seeing is we are seeing an overall drying capacity, but we are seeing major swings within dry and wet periods because there is more energy in the atmosphere, mostly, and this is not talked about, the carbon conversation is far too overblown, mostly due to there being too much water in the atmosphere because we have dehydrated our landscapes. Doesn't mean carbon's not a factor, it just doesn't mean, it just means it shouldn't be the, well, it shouldn't be the one thing we're talking about and it shouldn't be the one metric because there are so many other metrics that are more important right now. So that's why I wouldn't do something like this, because what would happen is if you get a cloud burst, this will turn into an aquatic environment instead of a terrestrial environment. And that's why if you do these hygge cultures, actually, if you take a look at, or, or I can take a look, I'm, I'm here, I'm sharing my screen. If you take a look at the mist land design. So this was um, a site that I was in charge of. Uh, I'm gonna clear this. Uh, this was a site I was in charge in Kenya. I created the entire water plan for this site and it's still going strong now. Oh my God, that was 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah, uh, 2013. Okay, practical agriculture institute Kenya. So what you'll see if you take a look through these photos is you'll see that we did a lot of in, uh, embedded um, beds, or we did a little bit of raising, but we then had these little areas around these sections that would feed them in case of water. Our situation was a little bit easier because we were able to take water off of the road. This is what it looked like a few years later. Um, so we were able to divert water off the road. And that was some, that would be something else I would think of, is that if there is um, areas that do have flow in rain times near you, create little buns, little speed bumps, and then bring water into your site. But that's how I think I would probably design that if it were me. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, I thought about this and then I was gonna look for this. So I think Colin, what I'll do is I will find my, uh, my master for water tests and um, I'll show you what sort of the the ranges are that are acceptable from a, a Canadian standpoint. And Canada tends to have one of the higher um, water quality pieces. So that's gonna be for me here. So I'm just gonna put in JKB and then I'm gonna make a note, note at Javin, um, find water, stand water standards for test and link here tagging Colin. Salty compost. We have a great ground cover called Purslane. Purslane is amazing. Um, there was a great study done, uh, man, close to 15 years ago, um, about how feeding Purslane to chickens can increase the omega-3, 6, and 9 by 4x, if, if memory serves. So something to think about if you are trying to look for extra fodder for chickens, purslane is incredible. Um, generally, if, if salt has been taken up by a plant, it is usually bio-unavailable, which means that if you, if you compost it, it is usually safe to compost. Um, I will make another, uh, I will look into this again. I've got another colleague who works in arid environments and salt environments. So at Javan. Purslane really is 
for us. We have a, it's the one ground cover that can go almost every, everywhere. So we're, we're even thinking of potentially just spreading it out across the entire plot because it's such good ground cover. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a colleague of mine that I think will be a good, good conversation. So I'll work on that. Thank you for your questions, Colin. I really appreciate it. Nice to see you at office hours. <clears throat> Sergey, watershed mapping. The upper part of my creek has a more or less defined watershed, but the creek side is pretty much affected by the whole creek watershed over 180 square miles. I include the map of the whole watershed, but wonder, but wonder, but wonder if I should do anything else to indicate the watershed. Okay, so I looked at this. Actually, I have it up. So are we talking about this creek here, Sergey? Yes, that's the creek, and uh, there is a map on the previous slide that shows the whole watershed. The one on the right with the multicolored, this is the uh, Fishkill Creek watershed. Okay, and does this creek, it doesn't look like it from here, but is this creek running through your property? Uh, through the very bottom of the property, there is a section that gets flooded. Uh, when the uh, creek increases, so okay. kind of like you see the last contour line, so like up from the creek to the last contour line. Gotcha. Oh, right, because we talked about this last time about live staking, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So your question is, what should you include uh, for your your watershed map, considering that you have this creek? Is that right? Correct. Okay. So if this were I, um, I would do both. I would have this. As, as a micro watershed, um, as, as in what would come here. The problem is, and you can see it here, is you've got a number of roads here. And so this water most likely doesn't actually reach you in terms of, of watershed. Um, chances are these lower um, roads do. And this is what's so hard about mapping watersheds in a, a developed context is because one, you almost never get the city um, hydrology map, which shows you where everything runs and all the rest of it. So this is good to say if there was no roads above you, this is what it would be. But arguably, that creek actually has more value to you um, as a watershed than this area does. So I would include it. Um, I'm guessing it's a named creek and it's under water protection in some way, shape or form from your pro from your state. Yes. Yeah, okay. So you probably can't get water rights to it and things of that nature. But if I think most people who are in permaculture think from time to time, well, if everything goes sideways, um, it won't really matter whatever those those regulations were, because we'll be in a place where we'll need to take care of our own resources. And that's where I would say that having a creek like that nearby and having potential systems or processes where you might have a gravity line that you put in or a ram pump or something to that nature that then started to utilize that creek for your situation would be useful. So yes, the short answer is yes, I would include it. Um, okay. More of a general question about slowing the water. We recently got from, from Puerto Rico where we stayed at a farm with a mountain river going through it, wild fun scrambling waterfalls and swimming in slow pools. But as locals said, we had to watch the weather in a whole, in a whole watershed. Sometimes there are natural dams that form and if they burst or rains, rains, water levels can rise several feet and kill you. El, el Gropi, they call it. Is there a danger of increasing beaver population in areas uh, that were heavily modified by humans and now lack floodplains and wetlands? that the water can go in case of sudden level increases. What are the permaculture solutions? Yes, so um, great instinct, great precognition to look at. And um, yes, yes, and yes. So basically <clears throat> we are in a, we're kind of coming out of the dark ages, if you will, when it comes to water and watersheds. We lost a huge amount of knowledge and experience and ability due to the religiosity in the dark ages, and we lost the literacy of the watershed. We're coming back to it. And people like yourself are having these questions, which are really good questions. Um, there's a couple of areas where I used to work in Canada where we had these issues where beavers were starting to dam back up and it was changing the hydrology of the landscape as we knew it. It was probably the hydrology as is. So generally my approach to this is to become a watershed steward, which means that you're actively participating in local watershed groups, you're actively mapping and experiencing your watershed, you're actively looking at drainages and seeing where the water flows and seeing if 
um, not just beaver dams, but if you have deadfall or if you have uh, log wash and log jams that come through there and build up so you understand what's happening. And then you can make, let's hopefully say intelligent decisions about what to do in those areas. In many areas, what I've been doing is I've been building up leaky weir dams, W-E-I-R, that allow a little bit of water through, but they actually hydrate a, an area and landscape. They also uh, stop sedimentation. So it can be a place that you can start to build up terraces and things of that nature. So generally the permaculture approach is to long, thoughtful, protracted observation, taking responsibility for the needs of yourself and your family, which is the prime directive, and then going about understanding that watershed and going, oh no, this watershed actually has value to me. I'm going to look at it. And then if you do have um, other creatures or animals like beavers uh, that are going and working within that la that landscape, being conscientious about how they're doing it, saying, okay, well, if they're here doing this work for me, how can I piggyback my needs and wants on that landscape? How can I find places for that landscape and their work to work for what I'm doing? Or how can I change my way of looking at this? Because they're going to be putting that water to, to good use. Um, there was a place that I was living once that had a major flash flood, like days after I got into it. And that's what I did. I, I went to the person I was I was I was living on the land. So they were the landlord. I say, listen, this is the work I do. I can trace this watershed. I can understand how this happened. And we can start to put in either controls or vegetation. One of the main issues is a lot of these drainages have been devegetated. And <clears throat> David Holmgren, actually in the Facing Fire documentary I did, um, he attributes his revegetation of the drainage beside his property with willows as being one of the defining factors of why the wildfire stopped, because it's very hard to burn vegetation that's full of water. So taking that approach of revegetating that local area, I think could have um, a lot of value in that situation. So revegetation is another permaculture conversation, mimicking what would have been there before another permaculture conversation. So I think there's a lot of permaculture approaches. A uh, colleague of mine, uh, Chris Moore, M-O-O-R-E, um, he works specifically, and this is a cool thing that California did. Um, they basically, on top of taxing cannabis farms, they said, you have to, if you have riparian area, you have to install um, <clears throat> these analogous beaver dams. You have to hold water back in the landscape. So it's full-time work. He basically, uh, as a consultant, he also runs Woody Rhino Farms, which is a cute way of saying pigs. Um, he uh, he basically does this work full time. He designs and installs these analogous uh, structures. So, yeah, um, full watershed analysis, um, being conscientious about what is happening, regardless of what you want, then being conscientious about your needs and wants, then being conscientious about the controls you put in or the vegetation you put in. Uh, so that way you mitigate these flash floods because when we take a look at a lot of vegetation, if we take a look at historical vegetation, generally these 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 plains, these areas that would flood, um, were were there as a control. And normally, and this is what happened to Calgary, Alberta, in twenty sixteen, I want to say fifteen sixteen. Um, basically, the watershed that is the Rocky Mountains, uh, east side of the Rocky Mountains, had been totally rip wrapped had been the dams of the Bow River Valley had been totally armored. So that way they got a full deluge of that water and it came in and Calgary's on a floodplain. So part of that is don't build your life on a floodplain. Don't be in an alluvial fan. And that's where watershed analysis can be so valuable. One of the very first designs I ever did, um, I gave the full value of that consult and I wasn't charging very much at the time by mapping out the alluvial fans going to the client and saying, do not build any permanent structures here. You can put your chicken tractors here. You can put mobile structures here, but this is a floodplain. Don't be on here. Um, so I would say your question hits really close to home for a lot of poor design and something that Seth said once actually, um, the majority of roads are built in valleys. The majority of roads are built where water has domain. And we need to be conscientious about building roads out of valleys. And PA Yeomans know this, knew this. Um, when, and he passed his information on to the agrarians platform. They knew this. So 
be conscientious. The reason why I go into such detail in my designs and go through a, a through a full GIS analysis and pay somebody to do that is I want to know where that water flows. I want to do what's called a total wetness indicator and a watershed ca capture QGIS. We're looking at doing a QGIS course this next year. I want to know those things so that way we have the ability to understand them. So full analysis and then design approach. It's a great question, Sergey. I'm really glad you asked it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is because I was sick for the last couple of times I got so much in me. Uh, book and resources, yes. So uh, uh, they never took my sub. Uh, I think I jokingly said it was something else, but uh, I, I said it should be called Saving the World with Sticks and Stones. So this is an amazing resource created by a colleague and friend, um, Neil Bertrando and Jeff Adams, who created the LTAC course. And this is basically the entire um, sort of prelude to the LTAC course, uh, low-tech erosion control, how to work with sticks and stones and how to build up these areas, these terraces. Um, I did an edit on this book and um, did recommend that they should call it how to save uh, the world with sticks and stones, but they did not take me up on that. So that's there. And then uh, your question was, um, uh, uh, living on the edge, is it worth it? So I have the original uh, book and then they changed it a bit. I talked with his wife because he's no longer able to, uh, uh, okay, this is not it. Where is this book? Oh yeah, it was called the Natural Processes Manual. It'll take a moment to download. <clears throat> so I can give you a quick scroll through this so you can see if you think it's worth it. I think anything that David Polster did um, is 100% worth it. And I think this is one of the few resources I'm so glad I have. So um, he originally called this bioengineering and then uh, switched to um, whatever that new title is. What is it now? Living on the Edge. Um, so basically this um, goes into detail how to go through, how to think about uh, ecosystem states and, and biotic and abiotic thresholds. Um, it gets into the tangible techniques of it as well. It's basically a technical manual. Um, it gets into the live staking, the waddle and daub. Um, it gets into how to, this was a, a modified brush layer, how to make uh, a way to hold in a terrace, which was a brilliant way of looking at it. He had these great uh, live smiles, uh, which can also be for flowing silt, a great place to do sandy areas. So amazing illustrations, great tables, great processes. Um, the Living Edge basically integrated the new photo or the new uh, manual, integrated all these photos into the, uh, the resource, um, which was incredible. I think it's a much better way of doing it, but it's the same manual just redone. I don't think this was my group. I think my group happened after this one. But yes, I would, I would recommend it's worth the $60 Canadian and the um, and the uh, shipping. Uh, not to mention, it all goes towards Dave's upkeep because he's he's in full dimension now, and uh, the the family never planned for him not being um, lucid into his old age. So, uh, and thanks for the link about uh, basins of relations. That's great. I pass that on to Dow and Devin, <laughs> who are the masters of catching all that stuff. Does that answer all your questions, Sergey? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great questions. Great questions, everybody. So yeah, we are at two minutes to go. So if you have only budgeted um, this time to be here, uh, then we're just gonna be going a little bit longer and you may wanna come back um, and rewatch this. Deli Borca, uh, my house is covered with asphalt shingles. We put new ones on last summer when we redid the roof to support solar panels. There's mixed information on the internet about uh, asphalt shingles. Um, being toxic, since we have to buy bottled water for drinking and cooking, which is super expensive, is there a filtering option? We can share the rainwater collected from an asphalt shingle roof is safe for heating use. Okay, so um, let's talk anecdotal information. Let's talk if you want to be 100% sure. Um, so first and foremost, uh, generally speaking, asphalt shingles after five years are uh, safe to collect rainwater from. Usually when you're doing it that way, <clears throat> as has come out from a fair bit of data. If you have your uh, tank and you have your inlet, usually you'll have what's called a calming inlet or a J-tube. 
sorry, I don't know why this is having a problem. Uh, having a J tube. So basically, what happens is the water that cut comes in. Um, I'm just going to switch around colors and what else. So the water that comes in comes out and it's a calming factor. And the reason for this is that it's been understood now that um, the water that then ends up in your tank, there's two biologically active layers that end up helping with the cleanliness of your tank. It's usually on the bottom in sedimentation. It's usually on the top. Uh, the Germans called this the Schmutzdeck, uh, biologically active layer. And so usually when you had your float or other elements that came from your tank, so you'd usually have, let's say you were um, having a pumping system, you'd usually have uh, a float here that would hold level. So if this came down, this whole float would come down and this piping, this would be rigid piping, but this is the drawing tool I have. This would move down. So you were always taking water from this area. And then of course you would have some kind of overflow, um, usually further from the top, or you would have it as a standpipe. And this is normally what we see. We see standpipes that are internal to this tank and then they come out. So they hold that top layer. The reason for this is that it's been shown multiple times in studies is that the top and the bottom layer are biologically active and are actually helping to clean the water. So the hydrocarbons that are still in asphalt um, shingles will rise usually and be skimmed to the top. And then any of that debris, that actual bitumen or that tar will actually fall down either into your first flush diverter or into this bottom area. So this tank configuration can be as effective as you know, a single first flush diverter or, or multiple primary filters that are removing some areas. What it does do is it does uh, uh, address hydrocarbons, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but if you wanted to be certain that it was potable, you would uh, use what's called a stainless steel micron filter, and then you would run it through UV disinfection. Um, if electricity was an issue, uh, you can work um, with uh, um, activated charcoal filters, um, but UV is definitely the, the potable standard. So those would be the ways that I would go about it. And I'm just gonna check that way if you're here. Yeah, you are. Um, so that would be the way. Uh, any yeah. and we have to wait for a yeah we have to wait for a five years or we can Th that's just what the studies say that basically okay. the, the extra hydrocarbon and bitumen that is in those asphalts after five years this was a Swedish study that was done um, it's it's uh, I think the words they use it was relatively safe it's them covering um, themselves so I would if I was in a situation like yours and you just did it. I would probably go with a tank configuration like this and probably go with a sub micron filter and then get the water tested and see what it's like. Yeah. The other oh, thing yeah. you could do is test the water off of it now, if you have a local testing site um, and see what's in the water. And then usually those water testing um, uh, uh, labs will have your max and your minimums. And then depending on what's in it, and this was my situation. So I, our water uh, from our gravity field had a high amount of arsenic and a high amount of selenium and a high amount of magnesium. And they were high enough, as well as E. coli and other things, they were high enough that we didn't want to drink that water. And so we ended up just getting a Berkey, B-E-R-K-E-Y or K-Y, um, that has activated um charcoal filters. And that's what I've been drinking now for close to 10 years. Uh, and then we did a couple of point filters. So we did charcoal filters coming off of the shower head. So that way it would catch the arsenic instead of doing a full, a full uh, house system, because we just, it, we didn't have the money for that. So you can also do point use. Um, so if you were worried about something like that, I may go at, at that approach, but I would get it tested first and foremost. So you've got some data to work off of. Oh, that, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Better um, be safe than sorry later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, any, anything else about that question? Or can we move on to your second question? We can move to second okay. question. Uh, I'm just going to clear this. In the practical permaculture for homes, landscapes, your community, and the whole earth, I read that gray water cannot be stored for more than 24 hours. I'm concerned now because we built the gray water system to clean gray water and be stored filtered gray water. 
It is about seven M3 capacity, so about 7,000 um, liters, of which we, uh, of which about half is used for three separate filter compartments, mediums for filtering that we are planning on using, different size rocks, quartz sand, ceramic, activated charcoal, zeolite, pine tree bark, and some floating aquatic plants. Also, are we planning to use solar powered air pumps to oxygenate water in the storage area? Question is, if we filter gray water, can we store it longer than 24 hours? Okay, so my question is, usually you don't produce that much gray water. Why are you storing the gray water instead of having it being used directly in the landscape? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are always lacking so much water that we were thinking like better to store than just spill it yeah. and use it uh, when we have those two, three months of drought every summer. So gotcha. that was the, gotcha. the idea. Yeah. So my experience with gray water um, and I had to build, I was tasked to build a gray water filtration system for a kitchen that had upwards of like 40 to 50 people using it daily. And my experience was not good. Um, basically, once you get to commercial grade, you have to get out of this mindset of DIY, especially with grease, and you have to move to a commercial grease trap. And I tried to make a commercial grease trap with milk crates and wire and all the rest of it. And one of the major things I said is that this will work, but you have to clean it out regularly. They didn't clean it out regularly. I came back after I think being away for two weeks and that gray water had gone septic. It was black water plus. It was disgusting, brutal. It wasn't anything I ever wanted. And so I had to learn the hard way of what Art Ludwig and John Todd and these other incredible pioneers in gray water will tell you is do not store gray water. Now, gray water is on a spectrum. There's light gray water and there's dark gray water and there's black water. Black water comes from your toilet. It comes from feces and urine. Dark gray water comes from your sink. It's when you are putting grease down there or uh, different types of, of, of materials into your sink. The problem with that is that in many ways, black water is more stable, call it, than gray water because all of that material that you eat has already been run through an animal. It's been run through you. And so while uh, feces and urine cannot be great, it doesn't go gnarly and it doesn't uh, bring in contaminants like uh, dark gray water can. And so one of the things, if you are including the kitchen sink into your processing, you need to be conscientious about um, bringing that gray water through a filtration process in some way, shape or form. So usually it's through a small, a small wetland and then applying it directly into landscape. And so direct to landscape gray water is, is what I have experienced in. And basically it's after filtering, you have a volume of water, call it 100%, and then you're doing what's called a branch drain system. So usually what happens is you've got a Y, um, a y uh, uh, plumbing fixture. And if it doesn't come with a clean out, usually what you'll do is you'll drill a hole in the top and put in like a piece of wood so you can clean out these areas because Think of gray water as clogging arteries. There's a lot of stuff in gray water. And even if you filter it well, it usually clogs up pretty good within these systems. And then you split it into 50%, split it into 50%. And usually you land it um, inside or outside a couple of trees. And the way you do this is you take like a, a growing pot. So like a number three or number five growing pot. And you bring in your piping. And your piping basically comes in comes into the pot, the pot's upside down, and you end up with all this mulch around it. So that way you've got this abortive air layer that's uh, above, so that way roots can't get up into your gray water. Because basically, if there's nutrition in water, roots will find it. Um, and that way it's direct into landscape. You can do things as easily as just having a bin underneath your sink and you're grabbing it and you're throwing out the door. And a lot of people who are into this work will have a knife valve underneath their sink before the P-trap, that'll basically just bring the water directly into a bucket so they can pitch it out the back door. There are ways to create such filtrated water uh, from gray water that uh, it can be run through micro uh, or drip irrigation. But long and the short of it is, gray water can get contaminated very quickly. You don't want to hold on to it. And especially in the summer, you basically want it to go out into the landscape. So that way, if you're showering, you're watering your landscape. If you're washing dishes, you're watering your landscape. 
if you're having a bath, you're watering your landscape. And that's why gray water can be so great. So I think all of the things you would do to make your gray water able to be stored would take more energy than actually just putting it into the landscape, which I think would be cheaper and easier. Okay. The issue is that my house is on the lowest part of the site. So those trenches or yeah, channels should be uh, quite deep then in order to bring that water to uh, other yeah, parts of the site. Okay. Yeah. New task for thinking. <laughs> well, for me. something that's really important to. Why my phone has decided to start speaking? Hold on. So, if your house is at the bottom and you want to use gray water moving up, do you have a washing machine? Yes. Okay. So, one of the things that might be useful is washing machines can pump up to two meters. Um, their, their pump has that ability. So you may want to take a look at, again, Art, Art Ludwig's Grey Water Oasis uh, direct to landscape, because he has a process of, of basically taking the effluent that comes from your washing machine and putting it directly into landscape. And the other thing you may want to think about from your sink is just using a five gallon bucket. And at the end of the day, after washing, taking your five gallon bucket, taking it out like with your compost and then putting it onto a couple of trees. I think, again, the amount of energy you put into your, your pumping, your filtration, all the rest of it, I just don't think you're going to get it back in usability. And so I would be more conscientious of taking point source like, okay, the washing machine's here. We can go up two meters. That could take care of this bed. Um, the bucket we will mostly take there. The, the shower and the bathtub, well, you know, it'd be this pump, it'd be this amount of materials. I'd much rather just make a kitchen garden bed right outside the front door or outside the front of the house that's a little bit lower that I can run that into. So that way I can use it. And this is usually what happens with gray water. Did you take a look at where each one of these point source uses are, or, or uh, yeah, sources, um, and then seeing where they might go instead of taking it collectively, mixing it, and then having to deal with it. Okay. Oh, disappointing, but yeah, I will have to redo everything <laughs> and rethink everything. Okay. Well, luckily you, luckily you haven't spent the money or the time yet, right? Like we're still in yeah. the thinking phase. Yes. And hopefully yes. this is a great example for everybody about and I know there's frustration taking this course, like, why aren't we designing it? We are like the observational process is that design process. It's going, well, what about this? And what about that? And then if you want, you know, go through the whole process, go through. Yeah. If you get a bubbler and all the rest of it, you probably could store it, but add up the time, the money, the experience, the, all the rest of it, and see what that amount is and that effort is, as opposed to using it just around your house in a way that, might make more sense and maybe a lot less money and may have a lot less risk. Yep. So I leave it to you and your due diligence to think through and, and figure it out. I'm not saying it's, I wouldn't do it, but from what you've told me and the amount that you're producing, I just don't know if you're ever going to get the money back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. I will do some experiments <laughs> and let you know. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you for that. Okay, hey, from Erkan Fidan from Istanbul. You know that there was an earthquake in Turkey one month ago. There is some work going on for earthquake zone. I also participated in the project named How to Plan Temporary Shelters After Earthquake. I think it's necessary to keep the rainwater on the roof circulating as much as possible. At the moment, it seems logical to me that the rainwater to be collected from roofs or from all shelters is collected by pipes from underground or above ground in a central storage unit and after some filtering processes are used directed to the shower area and the gray water from the shower is directed to the toilet area. It seems like the sustainable solution to leave the black water coming from the toilets to the plants to do the cleaning process. But the area where the black water will reach the soil makes me think. What should be the size of the underground for so many toilet use? Would it be more accurate to send black water outlet to each toilet to different areas? 
How can I avoid the risk of becoming in block? After filtering this black water with herbs, I can distribute it, distribute it to the lowest part of the field to grow perennials. Okay, great question. So, um, Arkan, um, I don't think you're actually on the call. So, um, oh, yes, you are. There, I see you there. Um, so I'm going to go into this. I'm, it's As usual, it's always going to be a bigger story than just the question. And here's the reason. So, yes, in... Um, Emergency situations, making sure that you have good shelter and potentially having that shelter double as rainwater collection is a great idea. Sometimes it doesn't always happen due to the fact that temporary materials, things like tarps or tents, don't make collecting gray water all that easy. So it can be difficult from there. One of the things that can be very problematic with emergency situations is toilets. And I would direct you to take a look at right after the Nelson, um, uh, the, the city of Nelson in New Zealand, and I don't remember the date this happened, but it's gotta be plus eight years ago. They had a major earthquake and they lost all of their septic sewer systems, it was gone. And one of the major issues was, well, how do we take care of human waste? And this happens in a lot of emergency situations. I originally was really quite keen about doing and developing a, permaculture first responders course and process. And um, a couple of folks started working in it. I thought it was taken care of, so I stepped back from the project. But one of the things you'll see in refugee situations, and uh, my colleague, Natalie Topa, who now works for the UN, knows about this as well. We did this in Kenya and Cuba. A, a friend of mine did this in Haiti in places that were not inundated by groundwater. So places that didn't have rising, um, rising water tables is working with composting toilets. The reason for this, the reason why working with composting toilets can be a, 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 a potential solution in emergency situations is just what you're talking about, is when you take black water coming from uh, toilet water, black water can be very difficult to process. And that's where I, I would direct you to places like um, John Todd's Living Machines, and really see the scope and scale it takes to process black water to a good level, it's, it's quite involved. Um, not to mention the sizing, the scope and the scale of all these things. And that's why composting toilets can be so incredible. There was two permaculturalists who took on the process of teaching the citizens of Nelson composting toilets to the point to where they were given the keys to the city because the mayor felt that it saved them in many ways because they had local areas, they taught people how to create um, the lovable Lou, which was um, uh, John Jevons, um, John Jevons uh, Human Year Handbook, the lovable Lou, which was the way to build the toilet, have the five gallon bucket after ne underneath all the rest of it, how to have central collection areas, how to work with composting toilets. We actually just uh, finished a composting toilets course with uh, Gord Baird, um, which is available on um, regenerative living. But the other thing is that it uses resource and creates resource out of it. So the other thing that's problematic after emergency situation is usually your food systems are broken. And we have one of the longest running civilizations that have fed one of the largest populations that have predominantly fed their agricultural systems with what they call affectionately night soils, which is basically decomposed or semi-decomposed human feces, which is China and most of Asia. So using those processes, using um, human your compost is a really valuable tool to understand, use and work with. And there's a whole process of, of doing it, which I can explain in short, but the human your handbook can be found online for free. Um, um, John Jevons made it available. You can find it for free and download it. And I would rather you take the gray water from showers and send it to vegetation. And I would rather you work with composting toilets if you're not in a place with a high water table. And even if you are, you can have bins like IBC totes or other receptacles to actually compost this material. And basically it composts in year one with what's called mesophilic compost, which means it goes up to a high temperature. And year two, it goes through mesophilic. And then in year three, it's usually ready. Not only is it sterilized, but it's also biocompatible for 
plants. So now you can apply it. And usually when we apply it, we apply it to anything with a woody stem. That said, for those of us that have worked with our own human manure compost um, and we're happy with the results and we, we usually get it tested, um, that testing usually shows us that we're above or higher or we're at or above commercial grade compost because we're so fastidious with our composting processes. So I wouldn't go through a, 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 a treatment process for black water. I would skip that whole thing and I would work with buckets and some kind of carboniferous material. So usually we work with things like wood chips or shavings. In tropical countries, we'll, we'll work with the offshoots of, of sugar cane harvest or sugar cane processing into, um, into rub, which is called bagasse, which we can add to uh, uh, human ear composting. And basically the process is quite simple. You're pooping into a bucket or a receptacle peeing and pooping, diverting that, that urine can, can have pros and cons. It's a whole conversation in and of itself. But basically the easiest thing to do is to have a single receptacle. And then basically after every deposit, um, after every use, you apply carboniferous material to the point to where you can't see anything. And usually if you're doing it this way, there's no smell, there's no issue. The only issue comes is if you start to float the material with urine. And so sometimes it makes sense actually to collect the urine and have a urine diverter and then to dilute that anywhere from one to two to one to 10 with water and to apply directly into the vegetative landscape because of the amount of nitrogen in urine. So I would say that there's a better way to go about this. And the way that I would go at it is I would take the water, if you can harvest it, use it for showers, use it for you know first use, if you will. Take that as gray water, put it directly into landscape. Same thing as I just described to Delhi Barca. And then I would use composting toilets, working in process and working in system. Um, I just think what you're describing here has so many points of failure. And if you're starting off fresh and new, can take a huge learning curve. Like you have such an exponential learning curve to learn about this and do it right. Whereas human ear composting actually takes a really low skill. Um, Gray water harvesting takes a little bit of skill, but generally, like even if you're direct to landscape and you don't do any filtration, you just send it directly to trees, trees take care of it. You know, that system I just described with the um, upside down plant pots, you don't even have to filter that. You could take it direct from sink, direct to landscape, which is amazing. You can filter it if you want to, you can have a little bit of a, uh, uh, a uh, like a, a living um, wetland and then put it in you're worried about that but there's just so many fewer points of issue and this is the major thing this is even with systems that uh you're living with the systems that you don't manage don't work well and gray water has probably the highest level of failure due to lack of intervention between the humans so that's what i would do and i'm sure you've got some questions from that Thank you. Thank you. I understood. Any questions or follow up questions, Akan? Yeah, Seven, you said that there's a free download. Yeah, so if you basically type in the human your handbook PDF, PDF, you will find uh, read free online. I think I said his name wrong. I think his name is Jenkins now that I'm getting to this. Yeah, Joseph Jenkins. Yeah, the other guy is um, how to grow more vegetables than you ever thought possible. So you can uh, read it here, you can download it, or you can buy it. Uh, makes for good bathroom reading. Um, but, basically, uh, but basically, he goes through the entire process of human ear um, decomposition. Also, a colleague and good friend of mine, uh, composting toilets, who wrote uh, the essential... Um, the essential. There you go. Um, so this is the New Society's website, and then he has his own website about this. Should both come up on Facebook. There we go. And then composting clouds. Yeah, so this is um, my colleague, Gord Baird. We just finished the essential composting toilets uh, design um, course. Um, but 
you can pretty much get by if you're just wanting to do a bucket system, you can get by with the human your handbook. He doesn't go into much detail if you have to work with things like batch composters or things like the Sunmar systems. Um, but Gord also has worked at scale to create institutionalized uh, composting toilet systems. Um, the other thing I'll say, because this came up in this course, is that <clears throat> people really want to create biogas digesters. And you can do that, but you basically have to get four to five households that are producing waste um, to make the biogas, biogas digester feasible. The opposite of that is if you have four to five pigs, four to five pigs produce enough manure that you can make a biogas digester feasible. And we did a bunch of those in Cuba. Um, so that way we could produce gas for use in uh, cooking. But that's the book. That's the Human Your Handbook. Great book. Um, you can read it online. Um, and, you know, I, I th there's lots of websites. If you look for downloads for books, you can probably find the books you're looking for. That's all I'll say, because that's probably all I, I should say. But there are a lot of places to find re free resources and to find digital resources. So there's there's opportunity there. All right, I've gotten to the end. We're only uh, an hour 30 over. Um, any follow-up questions? Any questions about the break? Any questions about what's coming up next? Um, anything at all that I can help you folks with so that way you've got uh, the second half of this course well in hand. Okay. Uh, can can I ask you questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what do you think about QGIS uh, software? I think I just met this week uh, with this software. Uh, so I began the learning. Uh, but but what do you think? How how can we use uh, for permaculture? Approach. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, uh, where I just I started a new project, and when I start a project, I will get or process or survey. Um, oh, funny enough, I didn't even download them because they needed work. Okay, well, instead, I'm going to instead show you a different version. I'm going to show you Bombini Homestead. So uh, the Bombini Homestead is a design I've been working on. And the best way to show this, I'll put this in my other browser or desktop. Okay, there we go. And I've got to pull this over so I protect the client material. Nope, the, oh, and then you open on this side. Well, that's fun. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's see if I share, if it'll share me. <clears throat> Preview, no, it'll just share. Oh, man. All right. Going to do this the hard way. All right, uh, so this is desktop two. You guys are seeing the island there, yeah? Happy, happy? Okay. So whenever I start a design, I will gather or uh, survey the landscape myself. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that. We can have that conversation another time. But um, when I do that, I then hand over my design to somebody who specializes in QGIS. And that person who works in QGIS will produce a number of maps for me. Uh, some of those maps, um, all of those maps, pardon me, I will be able to input into Google Earth Pro because I use Google Earth Pro with my clients because it's easy to use, user-friendly and free. And so they will create uh, maps like this. So this map gives me a sense, this was processed with QGIS to give me a sense of what the watersheds are on this site. Um, they will produce maps like this that give me a sense of what is the slope because there are certain slopes where certain activities can and cannot happen. Um, I will get it also in degrees because you'll work with some um, producers and uh, 
vendors who will work in degrees versus percentage. This is the wonderful thing about, and I'll say it, the states being so singularly minded to hold on to antiquated measuring systems that makes the rest of the world need to have two systems. I will then have uh, contour maps. It's the great thing about QGIS. You can also get what's called a hill shade. So a hill shade is for those that don't know how to read a contour map. You can see the flat areas, and then you can see the uh, steep areas and the ridge areas and all of that. Um, I will get a, another contour. This is what's called an aspect map. So aspect map shows you what, what aspect is everything. So nor, mostly, if you look at this and you look at the legend, mostly this is easterly with a little bit of southerly. And uh, knowing what we know, that southerly is the most powerful light, westerly is the second most, easterly is the third most, and northerly is the least most powerful. These folks wanted to create an, um, a cider apple orchard. And I said, you can try, but it's going to be hard because you don't get a lot of sun in these areas. Um, this is called a total wetness indicator. And I'll zoom in on this one as I pull it over. You can see here all the little drainages. So all these little drainages give you a good sense of where the water is flowing. And recently, um, I worked on a colleague of mine's site. I did the drone mapping myself. I took the ground points. And these drainages were within inches of where they were actually on when he got a flood. So Erkan, you great, create a great point. And I do this every time I start a big project. I will find these, this, I will find existing topographical information, usually called a DEM, a digital elevation model. Um, the problem with freely available digital information is that most digital information comes from uh, the shuttle radar topographic mission, SRTM. The NASA flew the shuttle over the earth in 2000. They sent out a LIDAR, light image detection and radar. They sent out a laser, pinged it off the earth and it came back. And they were able to, through water as well, get a sense of the depth of the earth. The problem was that every pixel of that mission was 30 meters, which means the computer didn't have enough information to give accurate representation if you had less than 30 meters of, of elevation difference, which is basically all of our sites. So all of the data that comes from Google Earth is from that, which means that it interpolated anything under 30 meters, which is why, and even you'll, you'll search for a contour map generator, there's the free one and then there's the paid one, the paid one uses that data. That, that to me is a very ingenuous way of using that data because you're basically saying this is what it is and it isn't. So usually what I will do is I will see if there is data available. And if you find a good GIS um, uh, technician, they have access to higher grade information. They either have access to specific LIDAR plots or informations or things of that nature. Um, or there is somebody in country or a province or region or state that has that information. The states generally has high, high availability of LIDAR. I imagine that the UN at this point or some of your seismic conversations due to the earthquake in Turkey either are going to quickly make that available or will actively start scanning uh, Turkey. And there is a far-flung conversation that um, Elon will end up through either SpaceX or another company start to LIDAR map the entire uh, world with his, his small Starlink satellites. There's a conversation that he actually put LIDAR onto those satellites, which is totally unverifiable, but you know, if anybody could do it, probably he could. Um, and then once you have that digital elevation uh, information, then you can apply it. Now your site is rather uh, bare and um, is, is potentially a good candidate for drone photogrammetry mapping. And this is where you use a drone um, in an area that doesn't have a lot of vegetative uh, canopy, because basically what it does is it uses the process of photogrammetry by knowing where it started on the ground by taking a geo-referenced photo, where it is in the sky, and basically goes over in a pattern, usually governed by a third party uh, software, and takes photos. And because it knows where it is, and because it knows the change in the angle of the photograph, it can create a digital elevation model up to eight to 10 centimeters accurate. 
And I have used this five times, six times to create a map of a property. Usually you'll be using a DGI drone because those are the drones that work with these third party programs. And there's two programs in particular. One is called Maps Made Easy. It's the cheaper of the two, but it is less accurate. And the other one is Drone Deploy, which is much more expensive and is usually requiring uh, a full year subscription. But if you tell them you want to test it out, they'll usually, and if you tell them the property and all the rest of it, they'll walk through how to do the mapping and all the rest of it. So if you know somebody with a drone, if you have a drone, and if that drone is on their list of acceptable drones to use, and I say this, Having recently purchased a drone because they said they were going to make it available, and because it was under, in in my country of origin of Canada, anything over 250 grams, you have to get a pilot's license for. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to run drone under. So I bought this Mini 3 drone with the thought that I'd be able to drone map with it. That's not the case. They pulled the API kit for it, which is problematic. So usually you're looking at a Mavic 1 or a Mavic 2 or its offspring or a Phantom 4. I believe it still works with the Phantom 3. The Phantoms are more stable than the Mavics, but I haven't seen anything the Mavics can't do that the Phantoms can do. And the Mavics are smaller and more compatible and all the rest of it. And if you want to do this full time as a service, you can. But basically that process can then produce a digital elevation model which you can then run through GIS, QGIS, ArcGIS, Q being the free version, Arc being the paid version, to produce these series of maps, which for me are essential for doing broad scale design. So that's my experience with QGIS. Right now, you can take a QGIS course through the agrarians, which I'll, I'll put a link up for after we get off. Um, and they have a very good QGIS mapping uh, 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 course. Um, or uh, I'm working with a gentleman who teaches at a college level who will be putting in probably within this year, probably end of summer 2023, we'll have a QGIS course specifically for regenerative agriculture and regenerative design up by, I would hope, August or September. So yes, to answer your questions, yes, I use it. No, I haven't learned how to use it, but I did take a course in it. And this comes from a designer who's a landscape designer in Canada who said, I would rather be free to design and do the hard work of design than be proficient in every single piece of software. And so this is why I have not become a Affinity, uh, Adobe Illustrator, uh, Illustrator, um, it's why I haven't dove into QGIS because I took the course from the instructor who ended up becoming my QGIS technician contractor. I took the course to realize I don't want to do this. I don't want to be ready with every single update. I don't want to be that guy. I want somebody I can give the information to and know in a week. And it's usually like 150 to 300 bucks, depending on the site. I can have the data and the maps back to me. I'd rather that then have to learn this process, the system, and always upgrade every single time. That man name is Brett Smith, and he runs Paper Street Permaculture. He's out of Alberta. He is amazing at this work. I cannot recommend him higher. And if you are working with uh, a topographic situation, I would reach out to him in a heartbeat. He's also a university professor, so sometimes he can be hard to get, get a hold of. So usually I leave at least a six week turnaround time for him because he, he has another job he does full time and he has a family. Um, I'm potentially gonna be working with this new GIS contractor who's had a lot of personal issues right now and has, ha hasn't has been um, as quick on the turnaround. And so I'm, I'm still hesitant to totally recommend them, but uh, I have reached out to a couple of people on Upwork, which is a freelancer site, as well as Fiverr and found people who work QGIS and can produce these maps. And basically I give them the existing maps, tell them I need them in PDF, tell them I need them as a KMZ file. And the reason for that is because I create a feasibility study, I want all of my maps there. So that way the clients can print them in 11 by 17 inches. Uh, so that way they can have the maps and they can go through them uh, because most clients don't think in digital programs. And again, we are designing for people. 
We're not designing for a program. So you want to be able to give a person something they can look at and go, oh, I understand this, as opposed to a digital program that if you do become versed in, in GIS, be it ARC or Q, you're the only one who's going to be able to operate that. And this is why I've gone to Google Earth Pro and a lot of my colleagues have copied me. Um, and I copied Neil uh, Bertrando because it's so user-friendly and it's so easy. So that's how I use it. That's why I use it. That's how I get the, co the contracting information. And then basically I just put it into a folder in QGIS and I can turn them on and off. So that way they can be on or they can be off. Great question. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Any follow-up questions to that or other questions? Sergey, it looks like you've unmuted. Yeah, uh, a question for the next time, but can you show us next time your uh, Google Earth kind of uh, workflow? Yeah, happy to. Why don't you put that in the questions below mm -hmm. um, for the next session? And that way I can pre-cog it. Um, I'll bring up Bambini because they've, they've given me permission to use theirs and I can show you where it is in the world, show you the different overlays, um, show you how design works from that perspective. Um, and then uh, can, can show you how, if the client is all right with that, and this is what I'm doing these days with clients, I'm saying, I'm showing them an example of a design in Google Earth Pro and saying, if you're happy with that, that's great. That's what this cost includes. If you want it rendered, I now have a landscape architect who can render for me. I've got a Blender 3D modeler. I have a Vectorworks 3D modeler. And I have my own, um, they're not bad. I use more Folio Trace because uh, I like drawing. And so generally for me at this point, my process has to be enjoyable to me. And I wish I had learned that when I started because I tried to be everybody else by using computer programs, went back to drawing, was super happy with it. And maybe I'll dig up some of my old drawings as well and show you guys that as well. But yes, Sergey, I'm happy to do that. Please put that question down in the next um, uh, office hours and I'll do a little pre-cogging on that, have that ready for you guys and we can walk through it. I'll do that over the break. Awesome. All right, folks, I would say any more questions, but I've been on for an hour 45 and um, I'm hungry. So I'm going to say uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> big thumbs up and big waves. I like that. Um, hopefully this was a useful session. It seems like we did a, a lot of deep dives into very technical conversations. So if, the, if there was an answer to a question that was technical and relevant to you, I would recommend over the break or this week going through it. And if you have a question about something I said, feel free to put the question in the next office hours. I'll go, I'll go deep into it. I'm experimenting by spending a little bit of money. I've got a colleague of mine who's a video editor who's going to start to take the questions and actually put them into their own separate videos. Um, so I'm experimenting with that to make my YouTube a little bit more searchable for questions and whatnot. And um, thanks so much. It's such a pleasure. I will be on uh, on Canvas this week. So if you do have any questions, if you need any help, I will be on Canvas this week. Uh, by the end of this week, I'll make sure all previous um, assignments are marked. So if I've missed something, if I've missed an assignment, as sometimes can happen, if I've missed grading something, because Canvas has this weird thing that sometimes I enter it and if I come off the page too quickly, it doesn't keep it. So if I have missed anything, let me know. If you have any questions, let me know. If you need some more extra time, let me know. But hopefully you guys are loving and enjoying the course. I'm sure like everybody, you would agree that it's far more work than you thought it would be. But this course, and I'll say this after having taught with seven other individuals who run PDCs, is the most comprehensive PDC that you can take in the world that I know of. And I continually look out, I continually look to see what other people are doing. And this still is the most comprehensive course. So I know it's a lot of work, um, but uh, take a look on the, and they're starting to be populated. Take a look on my, on the examples sheet. Um, you'll see that there's a whole new cohort because their designs were supposed to be in today. Take a look at their final SWOT analysis. And you'll see over and over, this was so much more work than I thought but I actually feel like I have a comprehensive understanding about the fundamentals of permaculture and what it means. So there's a huge amount of value that comes from putting the work in and thanks for putting the work in. Thanks for being somebody else in the world that's doing this on a small scale, large scale. And that's why I do this work because I need more people like you. And that's why I give, uh, I overgive definitely in this course, 
but that's okay because I'm I'm happy to help you guys all out. So thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. And um, yeah, have a lovely break. Uh, hearts and thanks. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.